When we moved to Pensacola, January 89, as I was traveling and preaching, it, people all over the world were enjoying this stuff on creation and dinosaurs and things I was doing. And a lot of times when they came down to Pensacola, they would stop over and see us. Well, my kids were at the time probably uh, 11, 12, 13. They're all a year apart, somewhere in there. And I wanted, I always wanted to make our place the go-to place. So I knew where my kids were. All the neighbor kids came to my house. It was never a question of, hey, where's the kids? Well, they're on the backyard, of course. There's so much to do here. We had swings and slides and cable slides and uh, a giant rope swing in the tree and lots of fun stuff to do. And everybody's coming over. So it kind of gradually uh, evolved, I guess might be the right word, into the idea of, hey, let's just put in a theme park right here in our backyard. We'll have a science center, a museum, and each of these things that we do will teach not only a science lesson, but a spiritual lesson. And so it grew to where hundreds of people were coming to my backyard. Everybody was telling their friends, you've got to go see the Hovind's backyard. It was, it was really was cool, brother. It was just simple stuff that was... Uh, I can I can go for days telling about dinosaur adventure and adventure. Anyway, finally 2000, we said, look, let's just open this to full time. We'll get somebody to manage it while I'm gone preaching. And so in 2000, we opened up Dinosaur Adventure Land. Huge swings off of the pterodactyl nest. Watch out! That first step is a doozy. So 250 foot pterodactyl glide. It, it grew into where we had over 100,000 visitors come from 120 countries, all 50 states. People came from everywhere. We had, I, I'm, I'm thinking, five or six or 700 people get saved right there at Dinosaur Adventure Land. It was really off the charts of fun. We're trying to teach the Bible, for heaven's sake, teach kids the truth. So Dinosaur Adventure Land had kind of what they call a soft opening. Rather than a big grand opening, we just slowly just opened it up, you know, and let everybody come. And then 2006, <clears throat> the government came, put me in jail, and shortly thereafter, my son said, we're going to have to shut it down. But we're not done yet. We're coming back, okay? Since 2005, the IRS has grabbed more than $240 million from bank accounts. Some of the owners are entirely innocent of any crime. How do they do this? Through civil forfeiture and structuring. I simply took a stand for what I thought was right. I still to this day think what I did was right. I don't think I broke any laws. I think uh, one of the dumbest laws passed by Congress is a structuring law. And I think that handed the wrong people a club to go around beating people with. And all you got to do is check the newspaper or the news. You'll see that IRS is seizing bank accounts and seizing property from people all over America under that stupid structuring statute. And that ought to be repealed by Congress and made retroactive. They should, Congress should simply say, the structuring law is repealed and it's retroactive. Any money ever seized under this law should be returned with interest post haste. 
They told me that I was uh, had been structuring deposits and therefore they had seized all my assets. Uh, they seized a little over $100,000 out of the uh, my business account here, uh, which was all that was in there. Took 13 years to get it and less than 13 seconds, I guess, to take it away. Lyndon McClellan is a convenience store owner in rural North Carolina and the latest in a string of small business owners targeted for civil forfeiture under the structuring laws. Stories like that are, are surprisingly common. In fact, since 9-11, under just one program, police have taken two and a half billion dollars in the course of over 61,000 seizures of cash alone from people who, and this is the mind-blowing part, were not charged with a crime. But these civil forfeiture laws have warped law enforcement priorities and perception, and nowhere is that more clear than Philadelphia. Philadelphia officials over a 10-year period have seized more than 1,000 houses, about 3,300 vehicles, and $44 million in cash. Philadelphia, the birthplace of the Constitution, is home to one of the largest property rights battles in the nation. Welcome to the forfeiture machine. Civil forfeiture is when police and prosecutors seize property they suspect is connected to a crime. If you are charged with a crime, the government must prove your guilt and provide you an attorney if you can't afford one. But in the upside-down world of civil forfeiture, it's your property that gets charged, and you must prove that it isn't guilty. You must pay for a lawyer or go it alone. And if the police and prosecutors win, they get to keep the property for their own use, giving them the incentive to take as much as possible. Nowhere is the civil forfeiture machine more active than in Philadelphia. Each year, the city takes the cash, cars, and even homes of thousands of its citizens who have not been convicted of a crime. Meet Jackie. Jackie lives in a modest house with her three grandchildren. One day, the police arrested Jackie's oldest grandson outside her home for selling a small amount of marijuana. There were no drugs inside, and Jackie has never been in trouble with the law. Yet Philadelphia now wants to forfeit and sell Jackie's home. The letter tells Jackie that to save her home, she must come to courtroom 478. When Jackie arrives, she sees no judge, no jury just a court scheduler and the prosecutors running the show. When Jackie asks if she needs an attorney, the prosecutor replies, no, your case isn't complicated, and hands her a long questionnaire to fill out. After Jackie finishes, the prosecutor orders her to return in a month. When Jackie comes back, the prosecutor orders her to bring her bank records. The month after that, the prosecutor orders her to kick out her grandson. Property owners are forced to return as many as a dozen times before they even see a judge. If they miss a single hearing, they lose their property forever. After nearly a year, the prosecutor asks Jackie if she wants to settle by agreeing to give up her home in exchange for half the sales price. Worn down, Jackie reluctantly accepts. It's not fair. It's not right. But there's no telling when this nightmare will end. Jackie is not alone. In over a decade, Philadelphia's forfeiture machine took more than 1,100 homes. That's more than 20 times all other counties in Pennsylvania combined. Altogether, Philadelphia collected $64 million in forfeiture proceeds. Shockingly, Philadelphia used almost half of that money for salaries, including the salaries of the very prosecutors doing the forfeiting. Philadelphia's forfeiture machine is unconscionable and unconstitutional. At least a third of the IRS's structuring-related seizures arose out of nothing more than a series of transactions under $10,000 with no other criminal activity alleged by the government. People whose money is seized usually face a long legal battle to win it back, if they get it back. The average forfeiture for suspected structuring took nearly a year to complete. Here in Philadelphia, if you have your property taken, you can come here to City Hall and go to courtroom 478 and try to get it back. 
problem is, the people that are taking the belongings are also the ones calling the shots inside the courtroom. After trial, they said uh, the judge changed the jury instructions and told the jury, if you find out that the Hovitz took out less than 10000 you have to find them guilty. Well, that's not only a crime, because you're avoiding the drug structuring laws. Of course, I've never taken drugs in my life. They said you're, uh, you're avoiding the reporting requirement of the bank. Well, that, that's a requirement the bank has, not me. Structuring laws say it's over 10000 in one day. Then the U.S. attorney said, now, that $400,000 that they withdrew all those years, that should belong to the government. We want that forfeited. My attorney said, excuse me, wait a minute, hold on, I object. Hey, those forfeiture laws are based on drugs. If it was drugs, yes, you can forfeit the money. This is not drug money. This is tents preaching and traveling and videotapes. And as Americans, we enjoy certain rights and privileges that are embodied within our Constitution. Mr. Hovind, you have enjoyed those rights and privileges throughout your life. I presume you've lived here and you've enjoyed them, just as most of us have. And as I tell immigrants who stand before the court to be naturalized, I tell them, with these rights and privileges comes great responsibility. And one of those responsibilities is the payment of taxes! This is a serious case. Serious charges, serious conduct. Make no mistake about it. By your conduct in this case, Mr. Hovind, in my opinion, you dishonored the men and women in our military. You dishonored your fellow Americans, and you dishonored the Constitution of the United States. If I were the devil, I'd soon have churches at war with themselves, judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse. Senior Vice President at Pensacola Christian College, Rebecca Horton, and her husband, who is the founder and president of the college, ran the country's largest publisher of Christian textbooks under a corporation entitled A. Becca Books. Rebecca Horton and her husband were liable for $44.5 million in back taxes. Ten years after Rebecca Horton settled with the IRS, she agreed to be a false accuser against Pastor Hoven. What's peculiar is that the IRS has a Judas Iscariot program for people like Rebecca Horton. This is IRS Form 211. The IRS has a whistleblower program. And if you know anybody who's not paying your taxes, hey, go tell the IRS on them, and you can collect 10% of everything that they owe once they actually collect the money. Praise God Almighty, we're going to turn our nation into a nation of narcs. And you can turn in your neighbor if you think he's cheating on his taxes. What's more disturbing is that Daniel Johnson admits that Pensacola Christian College wanted the land that Dinosaur Adventureland functioned on, and that Rebecca Horton saw Pastor Hoven as a threat. One would have to wonder, did the IRS strike a deal with Pensacola Christian College? In other words, did the IRS agree to give her award money for falsely accusing Pastor Hoven? plus the land that CSE and Dinosaur Adventureland sat on? The U.S. attorney on my case went down and seized the church bank account, and then a few weeks later flew to Detroit to have sex with a five-year-old. I got off the airplane with Vaseline and a doll, found out it's a sting operation, and he got arrested and put in prison and hung himself. We should caution you, what you're learning tonight is very disturbing. Yes, an assistant U.S. attorney from Florida finds himself on the wrong side of the law tonight. He's accused of going after a five-year-old girl from right here in Metro Detroit. Oh, it is just incredibly disturbing. Not only is this guy an assistant United States attorney, but he's also president of a youth sports association in the city where he lives near Pensacola. Of Florida, so he's got a lot of contact with young children. According to a deposition from the FBI special agent in charge of the investigation, Atchison told the undercover detective to tell her daughter that, quote, you found her a sweet boyfriend who will bring her presents. The undercover detective expressed concern about physical injury to a five-year-old girl engaged in sexual activity. The suspect responds, I am always gentle and loving, not to worry. 
Most disturbing to investigators is the suspect's third response. When the detective asks, how can you be certain there will be no injury? The suspect responds, just gotta go slow and very easy. I've done it plenty. Atchison is 53 years old, an assistant United States attorney in Pensacola, Florida, who described himself online as a family man. The Heldemeyers were down, I believe, in the Tampa area, and her husband wasn't any prosecution of him, and they moved her up to Pensacola, and she's still, she, she arranged it where there wasn't any prosecution of him, and they moved her up to Pensacola, and she's the one that put me in jail for the 10 year sentence. Michelle Heldmeyer then used her authority, knowing that her husband was ordering illegal porn to her own house, went to the Employees' Compensation Appeals Board and asked for workers' compensation because she was, quote unquote, in emotional distress. Judge Rogers say, Ken Hovind's crime is worse than rape, including one lady on our staff who had been raped. And she said, I was shocked to hear the judge say that. You don't understand what rape is. At trial, they, of course, record everything electronically, and they're typing it up. It takes about two months to get a transcript after you pay the money. So we paid 6500 I think, was the price, because you can't appeal without a transcript. So I'm sitting in jail for 16 months, almost a year and a half, waiting for this transcript. We put in several motions, hey, where is it? Come on, hurry up. It doesn't show up for 16 months. Highly unusual. This is the report on the National Lawyers Guild, the legal bulk work of the Communist Party. Done around 1915, it's a, it's a House report. The National Lawyers Guild is the foremost legal bulk work of the Communist Party. Its front organization is in the controlled unions. Since its inception, has never failed to rally against a rally to the legal defense of the Communist Party and individual members thereof, including known espionage agents. It has constantly fought against national, state, and local legislation aimed at curbing the communist conspiracy. It has been most articulate in its attacks upon all agencies of the government seeking to expose or prosecute the subversive activities of the communist network including national, state, local investigative committees, the Department of Justice, the FBI, and law enforcement agencies generally. Through its affiliation with the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and the International Communist Front Organization, the National Lawyers Guild has constituted itself as an agent of foreign principle hostile to the interest of the United States. Roger Baldwin, the founder of the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, said communism is the goal. The purpose of the ACLU was to advance communism. That's why they were founded. Communism is a theory that believes uh, that God does not exist or is not necessary, that man is responsible, ties hand in hand with humanism. Judge Rogers worked hand in hand with the ACLU to prosecute, reprimand, and possibly jail school officials for praying over food at a public school. The lawsuit filed by the ACLU against Pace High School and Santa Rosa County alleged school officials repeatedly promoted and endorsed prayers at graduation ceremony and other school events. The only reason why Judge Rogers did not find the school officials guilty, which would have resulted in jail time, is because over 400 high school seniors and their parents showed up to protest their anti-Christian agenda. After nine hours in court and 12 testimonies later, Frank Lay and Robert Freeman were found not guilty of criminal contempt charges. Above all, I want to, I want to thank Chief Counsel, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Just minutes after the verdict was handed down, Freeman and Lay were met by an emotional and excited crowd. Who is Judge Rogers really working for? What is she hiding? And why does she surround herself with criminal sexual deviants in authoritative positions of power? First, 
Judge Rogers has a serial pedophile by the name of John David Roy Atchison indict Pastor Hovind. Then, she has a prosecutor whose husband was involved in the ordering of illegal pornography prosecute Kent Hovind. And this same judge was involved in helping form less severe punishment guidelines for sexual deviants who had child porn in their possession. According to Judge Rogers, people who had possession of child porn deserved less punishment than an actual pedophile because they have yet to commit an actual crime. Pennsylvania judges have made a killing out of juvenile prisons. Mark Shivarella and Michael Conahan were convicted of receiving kickbacks for more than two million dollars from the developers of several private detention centers. But the real crime, according to parents, is that these judges then sent more than 5,000 children to those very facilities for crimes as small as fighting on a school bus or posting a parody of their teacher on the web. My kid's not here, he's dead! He got some hands! 